Hello once again. Welcome to Think 304 Managerial Economics. This is session 5. And in session 5, we are going to be talking about production. Now, in the previous session, we dealt with the elasticity of demand that actually gave us a strong insight into what demand is. What we want to do is to try and understand supply better. Okay, so from this session onwards, we'll be understanding supply better. Now, firms would usually exist because they want to maximize their profits. I mean, obviously, that's not the only reason why they would exist, but most of the time, they would want to exist because of profit making. And so it's important for us to understand profit. Now, when we take profit, it's made up of two main components, cost and revenue. If you take cost, for instance, um, how much cost a firm would incur would depend largely on how much output it's going to be producing. So if a firm is producing a large amount of output, then it's going to be incurring a huge cost. If we also take revenue, how much revenue a firm would receive would also depend on how much output is selling. If it sells very few outputs, it's going to be getting very little revenue. If its output is very um, big, then it's going to be getting huge revenue. And so we can say that both cost and revenue depend on output. And therefore, if we are going to be understanding um, the components of profits, which are cost and revenue, it's important for us to first understand output. Now, the act of coming out with an output is what we call production. And so now it's going to be very important for us to deal with production and look at how revenue and cost would vary with production because the ultimate aim here is for us to understand profit. What are we seeking to do specifically in this session? We are going to be looking at production in the short run and also be looking at production in what we call the long run. As usual, our text is going to be the basic text, which is by and Prince, and um, it's titled Managerial Economics and Business Strategy. Like I always say, you would prefer the eighth edition. If it's not there, then you can look at any other edition. Also make use of other texts which are very useful as far as this course is concerned. Now, so when we, when we talk about production, we we'll first want to look at what a production function is. Now, a production function looks at the relationship between inputs and output. You'd agree with me that whenever you set out to produce, you'd use inputs to produce. And therefore, if you want to establish a relationship between inputs and output, we'll call that a production function which means that a production function will show the maximum amount of output that can be produced with the given level of inputs. Now, in this session, we are going to be assuming that there are two types of inputs, only two inputs. I'm not saying that when you are producing, you would find only two inputs or two factors of production, no. But to simplify matters, we are going to be assuming that there are only two types of inputs, and these inputs are capital and labor, <coughs> which means that if we want to have a mathematical relationship between output and input, it will be given by what you see here, where Q is equal to, or Q is a function of labor and capital, meaning that our output, which is Q, depends on L and K, which are labor and capital, respectively. Now, when you are producing, or when you want to change your production, there are certain inputs that you can change immediately, and there are certain inputs that you can't also change immediately. i give you an example. If you are producing, let's say, bottles of water, the inputs that we we'll need for the production of bottles of water would be water itself, plastic, and the lid, and whatever we'll be using for the labeling, etc., etc. And obviously, we would also need laborers and we'll need um, a building or a machine to use in our production process. So all these things are input. Now, if we want to 
if originally we were producing, let's say, 100 cartons, and we now want to be producing 200 cartons or 200 boxes of water, there are some things, some inputs that we can immediately change, which would be um, the water itself. We can also employ more laborers easily. But there are certain inputs that we can't change immediately because we want to increase um, the cartons or the boxes of water. Those inputs that we can immediately change as we want to change our output, we call them variable inputs. And the inputs that we can't change immediately, when we want to change our output, we call them fixed inputs. Now, the distinction between fixed inputs, so for instance, in this case, a fixed input would be the machinery or the building that you are using to produce because just because you want to increase your output from 100 to 200 doesn't mean that you can easily increase the building size or the room size that you are using in your production process. So it then becomes a fixed input. So why is this distinction very important? The distinction between fixed input and variable input is very important because of two time periods in microeconomics that we want to look at. So in microeconomics, we have two periods of production, the short run and the long run, and that would apply to managerial economics. So the short run would be a period of production in which at least one factor is fixed. And the long run will be a period of production in which all factors can be varied, which means that we cannot talk about um, the short run being, um, let's say, one month, one week, two weeks, etc., or the long run being 10 years, five years, etc. The short run, well, we can consider a period as being short if there's at least a fixed input in that period. So, so long as all the inputs have not been varied by the producer, then we are in the short run. And so long as we can vary all the inputs that we are using in our production process, then we say that we are in the long run. So unlike um, debt that we will be talking about, we can talk about short-term debt, long-term debt, which, which short-term debt would mean um, one year or less than one year. In production, we cannot talk, we cannot give a specific period to short run or long run. It depends on how long it takes the firm to vary all its factors of production. So firm A can be in a short run for two weeks because it's going to take two weeks for it to vary all its factors of production. And firm B can be in the short run for up to about seven years or even 10 years because it's going to be taking firm, firm B to um, 10 years to vary all its factors of production. Once we've got this distinction right, then we are going to be looking at production in the short run and production in the long run. Before we move on to production in the short run and production in the long run, it's important to be able to tell or to be able to measure productivity. If you have inputs that are working for you, you need to be able to measure their productivity so that you know that you are on the right path or not on the right path. So one major measure of productivity is what we call the total product. Now when we talk about the total product, we are basically talking about the production function because it tells us the maximum amount of output that can be produced with the inputs that you have. Another measure of productivity is what we call the marginal product of labor. And the marginal product of labor is a change in quantity divided by the change in the labor units. Then we have what we call average product of labor, which would obviously be the um, output per unit of labor. Now, moving on to production in the short run. So we are, first of all, sticking to production in the short run. We've said that we are assuming that there are only two inputs that are used in production as far as this session is concerned. And so we are going to be assuming that out of these two inputs, capital is the fixed input and then labor is the variable input. Remember, in the short run, we have at least one factor being fixed. 
And so if capital is the, um, the fixed input and labor is the viable input, then labor is what is going to be changing if we want to be able to change our output. Now, because capital is not varying, and then labor is what is going to be changing, does it mean that, because, and, and we know that, if we want more outputs, we have to be able to um, use more inputs. Does it mean that we can continue to um, apply more and more of our variable input onto our fixed input and get a lot of outputs indefinitely? Or does it mean that our outputs would increase indefinitely as we keep increasing our, our um, variable input onto the fixed input? Well, not necessarily. Initially, with a fixed input, if we start applying our variable input, we'll see that our total product would increase and increase at an increasing rate. And then it will get to a point where it's going to still be increasing, but it's going to be increasing at a decreasing rate because that is when the variable input, the fixed input, sorry, starts getting crowded. And then it gets to a point where outputs will not change. That means total product will be at its maximum. And then output will start falling, which would mean that total products will now start falling. Because marginal product is obviously the change in total product, um, as a result of you changing your labor units, you would find that the marginal product would be increasing as your total product is increasing at an increasing rate. And where your total product starts increasing but at a decreasing rate, you find your marginal product falling. And if your total product starts falling, your marginal product obviously would be negative. Now, we can always establish a relationship between our marginal products and our average product. Or generally, there's always a relationship between marginals and averages. What's this relationship? Now, let's say you are in a certain class, and the class is made up of two groups, A and B. You are in group A. The average height of your group is, let's say, six feet. And then we bring somebody from group B, and that person's um, height is, let's say, two feet. What's this going to do? It's going to be dropping your average down. Um, dropping your average, sorry. The person we are bringing from the other class becomes your marginal. So your average drops because the marginal is below the average. Now, when we bring somebody from the other class, and that person's height is about, let's say, nine feet, Definitely, this is going to be pushing your average up as a class. And so because your average, the marginal was above the average, obviously, you are going to be having your average go up. So this establishes a relationship between marginals and averages in that whenever the marginal is above the average, the average will be rising. And whenever the marginal is below the average, the average should be falling, which means that the marginal would cut the average in this case from above and is going to be cutting the average at its maximum. Now we've said here that we cannot continue to increase our variable input and have our output increasing indefinitely. So what do we do if we want to maximize our profit? I mean, that's a reasonable question that we need to be asking. In the short run, we obviously would want to be comparing the benefits that we get from employing the variable input to the cost that we are comparing and uh, we are we are getting so if we are comparing the benefits that we get to the cost that we are incurring for employing an extra unit then what we are basically thinking about is that we are going to be looking at the contribution of the variable inputs in this case which is labor and that we'll call the additional product of labor or the marginal product of labor to the additional cost that we are going to be incurring for employing the units of labor, which in this case would be the marginal cost. Now, the marginal product of labor would be in unit terms. If labor was producing, let's say, bottles of water, then the additional unit of labor that um, the additional unit of output that the labor would bring would be the boxes of water. However, the marginal cost would be in monetary terms. How do we compare outputs or units 
to something that is in monetary terms. It means that we would have to convert the units or the outputs into monetary terms as well. We can only do that by time saying price by the marginal product of labor. That gives us ex exactly how much the unit of labor is going to be bringing to us in monetary terms. So then we say that we are going to be employing our labor in this case up to a point where the price times the marginal product of labor is equal to the marginal cost of labor. The price times the marginal product of labor, we would call the value of the marginal product of labor. And so we are going to be um, employing units of labor up to a point where the value of the marginal product of labor is just equal to the marginal cost of labor. If capital was our variable input, then we would employ capital up to the point where the value of the marginal product of capital is just equal to um, the additional cost of capital. In this case, it's R, which is our interest rate. So this is the decision that we would make in the short run.